Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jamie Wells, president and founder of the Yale Alumni Health Network. She's an award-winning board certified physician. And as an RSI alumna, she is the newly appointed director of the Research Science Institute, RSI, collaboratively sponsored between the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Center for Excellence in Education. She's published over 400 articles as director of medicine for an educational, <clears throat> excuse me, advocacy nonprofit and speaks often as a medical expert on all media platforms. Dr. Wells is a 2021 Global Blockchain Business Council Ambassador in Healthcare and a member of the Leadership Council of the Wistar Institute, our country's first independent biomedical research facility. As an adjunct professor at Drexel University School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems, she has helped them spearheaded the nation's first degree program in pediatric engineering. Profiled as a physician leader, she was recently featured in Health Ventures series, highlighting awe-inspiring women leading transformation in healthcare. And as a side note, she was an IBO finalist in 2003. Welcome, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. King um, and everyone for including me today. This is incredibly exciting. I wanna set a tone of some fun while learning something in the process. So. I uh, really look forward to chatting with the students and hope to bring some relief from this intensive period that you're going through. Uh, and first start off with just a huge congratulations. I don't know why it's, not, oh, here we go. Um, congratulations to the finalists. Um, I hope everybody give yourself a round of applause, Kathy, Michelle, <laughs> everybody give a round of applause. Um, I, I think inserting a gratuitous dog photo always sets a good tone. Uh, this is my bulldog. She's a brachycephalic breed, so it has a biology bent to it um, in terms of zoonotic, uh, in terms of zoology, veterinary medicine, med uh, pediatric medicine, uh, everything. So biology is limitless in, in, in where you can find it in your life personally or professionally. Um, I think, there we go. Okay, so anyway, congratulate yourselves. This is a major achievement to this point. You should be incredibly excited and um, no matter what goes on uh, from this point forward, your options are limitless and the sky truly has no bounds for what you can achieve. Um, I wish you the best of luck and let's, get a little into, let's move along a little further into uh, today's conversation. I don't know why I'm having, ah, here we go. Okay, so one of the big things I've learned in writing is show, don't tell. I um, not. I know you're getting infused with a ton of technical biological science talk. So I hope to give a little bit of a 30, you know, foot view plus a little 30,000 foot view at the many, many options you have in your future. Um, my theme of today really is that a strong foundation in the biological sciences is a vital tool in your arsenal that not only serves you scientifically and in biomedical advancements or facilitates truly a limitless career flexibility, but it will also hone your interpersonal skills, human understanding, empathy, and resilience. And you don't realize it, but every bit of knowledge that you acquire is truly cumulative and you can employ it whether you decide to go into research, whether you decide to go into policy, whatever it is that biotech that um, you pursue in the future or even now, insight into our environment, nature, biology will really, and any of the STEM fields will endeavor to serve you beyond reasons that you can even imagine at this point. So I'm going to first, I find that not telling you, but showing my, my pictures will um, inform, at least on my experience, uh, having sat where you are sitting uh, many, many years, too many years ago to count as ageless as I'd like to believe I am. It was, too, it was pretty long ago. So I'm going to just go through a little bit of the different things that uh, I have done in my career, hopefully to, because I would love to be a resource if I can ever connect you with anyone of interest. If um, you're you have passion for particular fields and I can inform on those, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd always happily hear from you um, and guide you in as best I can or make introductions that would serve 
pursue it, pursuing and facilitating your passions. And I'm going to pivot into my experiences in RSI and USABO and then uh, move on to some of my reflections uh, throughout my career in those fields. So first and foremost, I, at your age, wanted to be a physician. My passion was I was going to be a brain surgeon. And nobody could talk me out of it. That's what was most interesting to me. And I did pursue a career in neurosurgery. I wound up matching in the field. At the time, I was told I was the only female in neurosurgery, applying to neurosurgery in the Northeast. So I did start a residency in that field, which is surgery of the brain, spine, and peripheral nerve. And I did get to assist in a lot of cases that were just utterly fascinating. Ultimately decided it wasn't what I wanted to pursue in my lifetime, though I find everything neuro completely fascinating. And I wound up falling into pediatrics and truly fell into the field. Uh, there's an honesty and purity with children. It got me back to why I went into medicine in the first place. Uh, I have a particular love of pediatrics and geriatrics. Uh, and I practiced in New York City for many, many years. These are a lot of my babies. I'm helping and, and, and mentoring some of them. One of my uh, former patients texted me yesterday who's applying to medical school. So it has been a, a complete and other privilege to practice medicine and be a part of families. Pediatrics is really a unique part of people's lives. Uh, it is the grand humbler, whether someone's a CEO, an artist, or anything, it is a unique period of time. It's children's first exposure to healthcare. It is, um, I had the opportunity to diagnose things that are one in 60,000 to, you know, deal with rare disease. I did my residency at a cystic fibrosis center. So I got very involved with the Boomer Size and Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, volunteering for them for years as a medical expert answering questions online. And as I said, I practiced in New York City and was affiliated with NYU Langone, Mount Sinai Beth Israel, St. Vincent's Hospitals. And I um, really loved it. I believe in a whole old world style of medicine. 100% of patients had my cell phone and email. I did home visits where possible. Um, I got to watch them grow up. And as I said, I'm still in touch with many of them. And it's been truly an honor. Uh, I had a lot of, I really love the practice of medicine. There is just nothing more uh, highly valued and just, it's truly a unique um, and honored position to be a confidant to families and help them navigate uh, the world. And Unfortunately, healthcare has shifted tremendously. So I was getting a little frustrated at feeling that there was an ever widening gap between policy and practice, that those who uh, were making decisions in policy as well intended as they were, didn't have um, the hands-on experience of practicing and seeing patients. So I wound up shifting out of med. I'm one who puts a deadline on my complaining. So I didn't like, I felt that, um, a lot of the decisions that were being made were decimating healthcare and compromising patient safety, which to me is just utterly unacceptable. So I shifted out of practice and uh, went into, as uh, Kathy Frame said, uh, Director of Medicine for an Educational Advocacy Nonprofit. And I published over 400 articles on health policy to Alzheimer's, med tech innovation, things that I felt were incredibly important to spotlight that don't often get spotlight, get highlighted, especially in media, uh, things prior to that role. Anytime I would be on different media forms, it would be about what the media deemed relevant to talk about, which is a lot of times sensationalized or um, really, you know, creating polarizing and weaponizing healthcare. And that really isn't what I think it should be utilized for. I'm very about utilizing media for good instead of evil to assuage suffering. And so I've had quite a diverse range of opportunities as a result of using my voice to advocate for patients. I've really done a lot of different things to move forward from that. I've gone viral repeatedly. <laughs> That's, um, I think, the I, I've been on Nickelodeon on a children's game show. Um, I've operated heavy, heavy machinery on another show. I'm a very yes before no person. And I look at every experience as an opportunity to learn something and apply it elsewhere. Uh, this is one of my babies from my pediatric days in New York City, and we've gone viral multiple times, and we have the best time about it together. 
Uh, here's some of the stuff. I've been on every media outlet imaginable. There's, uh, I'm on the BBC talking about the weaponization of healthcare in politics. Uh, I'm very apolitical. I care what is the issue. How can we help as many people as possible? And a lot of the rest of it is noise. Um, I think it's very important. I don't care what it is you endeavor to pursue that you're effectively able to communicate what it is that you're most passionate about and what your um, work is. If you are a scientist and you can't effectively communicate what it is you're working on, you won't be able to really amplify that message of why it's important to divert resources your way. So I don't care what it is that you pursue, really understanding how to communicate that to whoever the audience is, whether it's the general public policy policymakers, uh, you name it, it is really critical and will help you in so many ways in your lifetimes. So I've really been on everything. I was on Al Jazeera, uh, talking about sickle cell anemia on uh, just every kind of range of projects on all media platforms. Uh, here's some more, some on radio, uh, in the one on the upper left that was uh, broadcast in China, so I was translated. I once did something on uh, the Learning Channel and I woke up at one in the morning and <laughs> saw myself dubbed in Spanish, which was interesting because I don't speak Spanish. So you really are in an incredible position now. You're meeting wonderful people who are going to do incredible things. And really anything is possible that you want to pursue. If you put the work in, um, you can achieve it and, for, and far exceed any of your predecessors. So I am blown away by all of you. And these are just some of the things that I've been able to do in my career. Uh, it's very important for me. I'm motivated to make a meaningful impact wherever I am. Uh, I want to try and make any environment better than it was before. So here are some other photos at the bottom. I'm there with the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, Dr. Paul Offit in the center there. He is the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine. Um, I'm giving a talk to students at Fordham University at the bottom part of the screen on pre-health uh, pre -health students and the impact they can make whether they go to medical school or not in the healthcare domain. Um, to the right, I wrote a lot that, um, uh, as I said, on the weaponiz weaponization of healthcare, that got me an invitation to the White House. I got to see all of the White House medical unit and what their capacity is. It's on, I'm always dreaming and having new bucket lists. My, my next bucket list item is going on Air Force One. So I, I hope to achieve that at some point. I'd love to see what the surgical capacities are there. Um, I facilitated in that picture with the Department of Transportation an interagency meeting of leadership between uh, Health and Human Services and the Department of Transportation in service to uh, improving issues with organ donation and, and distracted driving. Uh, so really, you can utilize your background in a whole host of ways. I just want to make sure I'm not going, make sure you tell me if I'm going over time at all. Uh, as you can see on the all the way to the left, that's with me with Miss D, the um, Joanne De Janeiro, the president of CEE. So they have been in my life since I was where you sat and have been an incredible inspiration. Um, the Wistar Institute is as you can see in the center is our nation's first independent biomedical research facility and certified cancer center. At the bottom, you'll see me with Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen is an inventor who did, everyone's familiar with the Segway, uh, but he also invented the portable at home dialysis machine, the uh, iBot wheelchair that navigates stairs, can uh, go on the beach and rise to the level of a standing person. And he really sparked within me this, uh, his nonprofit first for inspiration and recognition of science and technology uh, is hosts a world robotics competition that's so much more than robotics. And in being a judge for that, where I've judged the local, regional and world championships, I was exposed to the formal field of biomedical engineering. And that wasn't a formal field when I attended school. So just to, I was so focused on at your age of going into neurosurgery. And when I started medicine in medical school, I was so driven to go into neurosurgery at, that I, I didn't see the other uh, things that were around me. And that's important. It's important to pursue a dream, achieve it, and realize that you've evolved or grown or have other interests and redirect. And so I found this field of biomedical engineering just utterly fascinating. And I'll, I'll go back to how it's such a full circle moment for me in a moment. But 
in my mind, I thought, oh, I'm not going to school to become an engineer at this point. I need to hook up with an engineer and be able to inform on the clinical issues because I feel like there's so much lost innovation on the front lines of healthcare. And a lot of times those on the front lines of healthcare aren't the ones who get the voice to impact change and, and make policy. So I wound up ironically in the last um, year and change being asked to get involved with Drexel University School of Biomedical Engineering Science and health systems about their spearheading of this new program in pediatric engineering. And so I got to work with a biomedical engineer. And it, it's so funny because you put it into the universe, but it, it totally came up into my life in such a serendipitous way that made so much sense and cumulatively was the right time for that to happen. I have had many, many years in practice. I see where things need to be shifted or changed, what adjustments need to be made in terms of therapeutics and medical devices. So you just can't imagine when you think you're going in one direction and another entirely uh, enters the floor and it could be better than you ever expected. As you can see here in the bottom right, that's me with John Cronin, um, who is, that was a hearing at, in Congress on getting small businesses to um, improve their use of accessibility. Uh, here I am with Ambassador Nancy Brinker, who is the founder of Susan G. Komen and who has single-handedly reduced stigma of breast cancer, raised awareness and, and research funding. So I have had the great luxury with pursuing my interests and passions uh, to encounter such extraordinary people that allow me to continue to grow. And I really think it's only just the beginning. So I can't even imagine where all of you are going to head because you're gonna far surpass anything that I've done, that's for sure. I'm so impressed with all of you. Um, so I just want to go back slightly to, I was a unicorn at my time. You're not used to this as much, but when I was, I went to an all-male school, believe it or not, I was the first class of females in an all-male school. And before I dive right into that, I just want to, I was greatly impacted by my grandfather, who was a civil and architectural engineer. He was born in 1894. He lived with us growing up. We all contributed to his home health care. He was a true Renaissance man. He could solve a calculus problem in one hand, a um, paint a portrait in the other simultaneously. He could listen to any piece of music he's never heard before and five minutes later play it on the piano. So he really inspired me. He saw at, from his engineering background, he instilled with me this mindset that, that failure is not, it's just one other way not to do something, see the opportunity, not the obstacle. He in later life developed an int intractable intention tremor and an intention tremor is when you intend to do something that you shake. And with another person may have just stopped drawing, stopped playing music, stopped doing calculus problems, but no, he utilized his engineering background to design stabilizing contraptions for his upper extremities so he could still paint, still draw, still do the things that he wanted to do. Now you can see a distinction between the pre and post tremor artwork and math uh, handwriting, but he really did achieve 80, 85%, which is quite extraordinary. So things are going to happen. You've all experienced that this year is my main point. Um, with COVID and, and not being able to do certain things. Uh, in my year, when I uh, was a finalist in USABO, we were supposed to do the International Biology Olympiad in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, Poprad. And because of political strife, the trip was canceled. But I wouldn't have been able to do the other things that I was able to do had I gone on that trip. So other things will come about when you encounter obstacles or encounter um, disappointments that you can't even imagine and you'll be so grateful for and you just don't have the vantage point of hindsight and it, unfortunately it's inevitable so being as adaptable as possible will help you tremendously well, I show this picture because when I transferred to the school when I was younger, in third grade, I was doing sixth grade math. And as I said, I went to a school that was almost 300 years all male. And when I entered, we were the first class of females going forward. And they had promised my parents that they would accommodate my math skills. But when I arrived at the school, it was, we don't believe a girl can really do that in math and made me get independently tested, which then came back that I was doing ninth grade level math. And they felt that that would be psychologically damaging to put a fourth grade girl in an all male ninth grade math class. So these were some of the things that I experienced being the pioneer. And I incorporate some pictures so you have a sense of 
this is the math team, as you can see, glowingly is on the on the right. That was a big year. We got a second girl in math on the math team. So basically, I was the first female ever to do everything, uh, along with another uh, female classmate of mine uh, who did a lot of things as well. So we were the pioneer class, and that was quite an interesting learning experience. Taught me a lot of resilience. Um, and as you can see, it's me and. That's pretty, that was pretty much my standard experience. So when I went to RSI, I got to meet my people. And you can see that um, this was RSI from 1991. So it's quite, RSI is the Research Science Institute that accepts about 80 students worldwide who are top STEM scholars. They also receive intensive instruction in the first week. And you work on an original research project through the summer where you're paired with a mentor. Uh, you wind up presenting it oral and written uh, at a symposium at the end of the summer. Many go on to win competitive prizes. Someone, an alum from last year, won the Regeneron Science Talent Search Prize, first place $250,000 prize a couple months ago. Uh, Another just co-authored as a first author, a paper in a major health policy journal. So they do quite extraordinary things. About a third come from international communities. The rest come from the U.S. And you really have such an extraordinary experience of international diplomacy, meeting people from around the world. So this was a very special experience for me. Uh, I definitely have always been the um, underestimated <laughs> One, uh, that may not be your experience, but that was what was the setup for me, having been the first class of females, etc. You can see I'm in the pink. You have to beat to your own drum. And, and I remember my first day at RSI uh, overhearing some students say, oh, that girl, Jamie, she must be a quota from North Dakota or something because... I guess I was personable and, and friendly and, and, and um, I like to make the most of each experience, but everybody's personalities are different. And so I did a math problem that nobody else could do. And then suddenly I, I broke in and it was just an extraordinary experience. That picture of that girl in that photo, never in a million years would imagine that I'd be sitting here now speaking to you or directing this year's RSI. And it's just the greatest gift ever. And life takes you on so many twists and you just can't even imagine the wonderful opportunities that lie ahead. So I'm, I'm just super excited for you. And this is just a short, sheer joy for me to get to be here. Uh, one of the things that I just, you know, you're so focused on the science. You're so focused on your goal of, you know, getting on the team and then getting on the next thing. But don't miss out to open your eyes of what's around you. I met, as you can see on the upper left, those are two students. That's us from RSI from 1991, uh, I'm ageless, so don't ever, this is HIPAA protected, don't repeat the 1991 aspect of it. But as you can see, we've been a part of each other's lives till now and professionally and personally. In the center photo, you see both of them uh, when they were pregnant. I was their pediatrician in New York City. We all got to live in New York City together at one point for an extended period of time. To the upper right, I think uh, during the opening ceremonies, I heard one of the students is from Thomas Jefferson's uh, high school in Virginia. Well, the two of my close friends here from RSI uh, are graduates of that school and one was living in Atlanta, one was living in Hong Kong and it was their reunion for at for TJ uh, High School and so they included me in their reunion. They flew in and I met them in, in Virginia and we've been a part of each other's lives ever since. Dr. Sarah Sarvis Mia is a pediatric neuroradiologist so in addition we got to work together. So you are going to be encountering students now who you will work with in the future. She is a very esteemed pediatric neuroradiologist, written textbooks on the field. Um, Susan Coe is on the board of CEE. She triple majored at Harvard, ran an entire economics conference while an undergraduate. She was the first, she was the only female executive at the Carlisle Group in private equity. So you will meet just such extraordinary people. And I would urge you to stay in touch with those who you admire and respect, who, uh, uh, you know, really it's very hard to find those not of quality, but I would say stay in touch with those of quality and they will enhance your life. And those relationships really do become like a family, no matter what I've done in life, those from CE, RSI, and these experiences have always been a part or will be helpful in any opportunity. So it's just an extraordinary family and a unique 
situation that will really uh, extend well into your lifetime if you're open to the experience. Uh, as I was saying, this is a full circle moment. This is my announcement of, as you can see, Jamie's also one of five Americans competing in the International Biology Olympics held this summer in Poprad in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia. You'll see that I also had won this USA Today scholarship and you'll see on the upper right, Miss D is accompanying me. And there we are at, the, at one of the Christmas parties a long time ago. So you really do create such a network of support that, really helps you facilitate your individual dreams. And your dreams can be your own. They don't have to be mine. They don't have to be anyone else's. But this is really just a wonderful opportunity to meet a ton of people who can have such a meaningful influence in your life and um, vice versa. We're thrilled to encounter you. So I think the big themes that I would say is do see the opportunity, not the obstacle. The world will try to impose a box like, you do biology, you must do this. You do this, you have to do that. And there's always a way and there are always new dreams. So it's a dynamic and fluid process. Uh, if you encounter situations where minds aren't open, I have never changed or opened a mind by yelling at someone or you know criticizing. I've always felt that the best way to show who you are is to lead by example and deliver the excellence that you deliver and the world will follow. So what other people's fears are, don't let them put that onto you or limit your potential. It's always important to hear constructive criticism. Um, you, If you hear recurring themes, then you want to assess those and, and see what, where you can make tweaks because we all can always do better. But, you know, Dean Kamen always says that when people tell him something's impossible or he's crazy, he knows it's a definite maybe. So just recognize that all of the things that you want to pursue, they are likely achievable and the way that happens may not be as you anticipated and can even wind up being better. So the field of pediatric engineering is, again, it's a full circle experience for me. I grew up with such an exposure to engineering as designing solutions. I grew up um, really loving the creativity of that aspect. And I was exposed again to it through my interactions with FIRST about a decade ago. And now I'm actually in my work life working on an entirely new applied science called pediatric engineering, which is just incredibly exciting. This artificial, we got the cover of the Artificial Organs Journal that's coming out this week. And it's just incredibly thrilling to be a part of a, a new applied science. And what is peds engineering? A lot of people think, when they hear that, they think it's something like, um, you know, designer babies, but no. When you consider in medicine everything that a physician utilizes to treat a patient, whether it's medical devices, therapeutics, the syringe, there are physicists involved in designing that syringe and rate of flow. So anything utilized to help monitor, diagnose, treat a patient is um, biomedical engineering. And so pediatric engineering, it always used to be the conventional wisdom that you can take any adult product or any adult treatment and retrofit it to a child, that they're just little adults. And what we've come to realize is that's a very archaic way of thinking. Children are not little adults. A premature infant may have the heart the size of a walnut and they may have a congenital heart defect that they have to utilize a cardiac pump all throughout growth from early childhood to later childhood and adolescence into young adulthood. You can't take the same pump utilized for a six foot five, 40 year old male as you can for a extreme premature infant. So a lot of equipment now, you know, a lot of ophthalmologic equipment, retractors for the eyelids are utilized in open heart surgery for young infants. Their skin is more fragile. There's, uh, it's, it's not just an issue of scale and size. Children go through biomed biopsychosocial changes. They have changes in their personal autonomy all throughout as they develop and grow. You know, they can't, they're nonverbal for a significant portion early on. Their insight is different. Um, adolescence is a, is a whole different time. So the life cycle of the pediatric to young adulthood patient has great challenges in terms of, and, and just great heterogeneity in terms of genetics, um, acquired disease, rare disease, inherited disease. Um, as I said, biopsychosocial development, you may have multiple caregivers at a certain point or another. So there's great diversity in what goes on in pediatric and adolescent medicine. And the world is taking stock that 
technology can be the greatest thing in the world, but if it doesn't consider the end user, if it doesn't utilize an empathetic and humanistic lens, then it'll sit on a shelf forever. So true collaboration, I'm getting to be a part of genuine collaboration. I'm working with biomedical engineers, cardiothoracic surgeons, um, and a whole host of subject matter experts in the field in helping uh, train the next generation of engineers for um, the ever-evolving field of pediatric engineering, which has an increasingly growing global market. So it's it's very exciting. You hear about you hear buzzwords about personalized medicine and that kind of thing, but a lot of times they're just buzzwords. And here, really, as you're seeing with children being included in clinical trials now, which they previously weren't. Um, there's really been an evolution of thought, and that's extremely exciting to be a part of, and you'll be a part of a lot of those things as well throughout your career, intentionally or just unintentionally. And we're, But all of the things that you work towards aligns those um, interests and, and allows you to really go further than you ever anticipated. Um, I know that I think we're running out of time a little bit, but I just want to throw some things at you that stay in touch with those people who inspire you. Ask for what you want. If people are not mind readers. Don't try and be anyone other than you are because who you are really is amazing and you have unique and special gifts that others, that would only enhance everyone else's experience. The other thing that I've learned is sometimes when you're such a high achiever, you look at, the, you want things to be perfect with everything. And when you really focus on, you know, you can often make perfect the enemy of the good. And indecision is as much of an action as a decisive action, but a lot of times will keep you stuck in an rut and not making any decisions. So try your best to make choices based on the information at hand. You can always course correct, but keep it moving and keep the momentum so that you can continue to grow and evolve and it doesn't make those stuck moments, which we all have, uh, last longer than they need to be utilizing a lens of empathy and inclusion will truly yield your greatest dividends. Um, this is an incredible time for STEM. It's not just an, a terminal degree. If you want to be a scientist and pursue traditional research forever, that's an opportunity that's, that is filled with exciting options. If you want to utilize that knowledge in different ways, that also can be spurred in so many different directions, and that will only continue to evolve. Um, finally, I just want to give a couple of my personal testing tips for whatever it's worth, because in addition to the tests you've all gone, if you go the medical route, I've had more eight hour days of testing than you could possibly imagine. I have, you have to do every 10 years, um, your medical boards as well. So a couple tips that I always did for tests is I try to mitigate the thing, the stress of what I can control. Now things are Zoom for you, but I always would, whenever I have some big exam, do a dry run to the testing site, check your Wi-Fi for a Zoom link, which is probably more appropriate for you right now. Uh, I always found dressing up as opposed to being too comfortable would, would make me a little more, uh, a little, little less likely to be lax in my thinking, but we're all different in terms of that. I always had go-to foods and snacks that weren't too tiring, that would give me a boost and not make me have to, you know, you want to always consider drinking, keeping yourself hydrated, but not also having to go often to the restroom frequently because you want to be focused on your exam. Um, whenever I do, I think any exam that you take, do as many practice tests as possible, but always, always, always look at the review summaries of the questions you got right as well as the questions you got wrong, because you'll find that a lot of times you got them right for the wrong reasons. So be adaptable, no matter what happens to you, something will refocus and get back in the game. For my pediatric boards, which were offered once a year, I had a um, hundred and some fever and was sick as a dog, but had to do it if you don't pass your boards and you can't work for a year. So it is what it is. The student who won the Regeneron Prize last year had issues having to change mentors in the middle of the program and went on to win Regeneron. So be as adaptable as possible and you'll really um, create a lot of peace and joy and success in your life, honestly, if you can. Um, I also found that I would avoid discussing questions with other test takers during the breaks. I would stick to myself because a lot of times it would lead to unnecessary extra stress. And also do your best as stressed as this time period can be to recognize that you have already succeeded, you know, going to the finals, um, the International Biology Olympics will be a um, certainly a dream come true, but you've already achieved 
tremendous success and it, and whatever happens in this next week won't limit anything that you endeavor to pursue. So I wish you the best of luck. I thank you for letting me uh, chat with you and I hope you got something out of that ex of this conversation and I look forward to hearing any questions. You do have a few questions. Dr. Oh, Wells. Okay. okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Uh, the first one is, hi, Dr. Wells. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm really interested in science education. What's the most important thing you've learned in your work expanding educational access to underserved children? You know, I think that number one is you can reach, you know, you're in such an incredible period of life where, you know, I didn't have this internet access of things when I was coming up. And now you can really, there are so many avenues to get information to folks. There are so many organizations that are working that love, so like start volunteering now to, to giving back will give you so much reward and will also instill with within you such a knowledge. You learn so much from your exposure. Um, I, you know, one of the greatest gifts I ever had in practice was treating all ethnicities, all socioeconomic strata, every um, career profession you could imagine. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, it was just an extraordinary opportunity and I gave talks wherever. I, I don't think, um, I think every single person has value to contribute and there's so many ways to get your messages across these days utilizing the internet um, between social media, writing articles, um, you know, working with a lot of nonprofits that go into schools that, you know, I've given talks to over my career to parenting groups, to schools, to struggling expectant mothers, to whatever. So I have to say that your unlimited access to doing that, I would try and make as much as possible priority to do so. And there's so many ways you can achieve it if it's your interest. Um, what topic the did next I start? Could, yeah, what's, okay, you're reading them. Go ahead. Sorry, I just, yeah, I just pulled that up. So at RSI, I, you know, it's so funny because I was a math person. And when I got to RSI, I was assigned a biology project and I was assigned a gen gene therapy and breast cancer research um, project at the Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Research Center. So that was incredibly interesting and uh, a wonderful experience. Is there anything in particular that gives you the courage to switch between many different successful career paths and future to nonprofits? So what I will say is when you want to make a switch, <laughs> for me, I spent two years in my mind knowing that I needed to make a change, that there were things that were bothersome to me. And that's kind of why I, you know, I remember hearing someone say, turn your mess into a message. And we all go, we, we all hear, I remember hearing this refrain because we're, this is the biggest thing. I, I like to call myself a silo slayer because I've learned that sometimes staying so in our own echo chambers, which every profession has. So there's a way of thinking in medicine. There's a way of thinking in law. There's a way of thinking in everything. And sometimes that can hold you back from being, honest with yourself and taking a personal inventory of what you need to do. I just remember hearing the frame, refrain of, well, you're a doctor. What are you going to do? Well, what else can you do? You're a doctor. And I just, I knew in my core that, yes, it's not an easy path. I, I won't say that it's easy to do career transitions, especially the further you get into it. You're more fearless now where you are. And as you get older, you have other responsibilities. So it's, it's the one thing that I would say is when you do make career transitions, there are some optimal ways to do that in a planning, thoughtful way. But sometimes that doesn't always match. People are messy and complicated. They don't, you think you may love something and then you don't know until you actually do it or it's, or you do love it and then you grow and evolve and your priorities shift. So the one thing I would say with career transitions, you have to be prepared to sacrifice for at least a couple years, um, sometimes financially, sometimes in terms of your lifestyle to get you on that change and get you on that course. And I think that it is 100% worth it. I've dealt with people at the end of life and I've never encountered someone who regrets this. It, it, most of the times what I've encountered are people who regret the things they didn't do. So though it's not an easy or simple road to shift in your career, um, most of the time because you're encountering others who, um, you know, the world tries to pigeonhole you. And, you know, some of us that just doesn't work for. Others, that's the right thing. But, you know, you have one chance at this world. 
I have a father who's had three different cancers. One of my dearest friends passed away of cancer a couple of years ago. I have been in the field of medicine. And the one thing I can say is it's really given me the realization that you live once. You have to pursue the things that you're passionate about pursuing. There's really no downside. You know, when I, when I really thought about it, I was like, okay, so I'm still a doctor. If I try something else, I can still go practice, which is quite extraordinary. And maybe I will again. So I've kept all my licenses. I've maintained everything and given myself the option of being able to weave and pivot. But it definitely requires a little sacrifice in those adjustment phases that is a little protracted. Um, what was your favorite experience, the most important thing you learned at RSI? Well, when I was at RSI, I was, we had it in DC. It was like the year or two before it moved to MIT. And one of the greatest things, honestly, I met kids from all over the world. I met others who were like me and interested in the things, who had um, all different kinds of passions. I really, I really value more than I ever knew all of the, you know, I, I am getting mentors. One of the mentors for the students, um, I'm, one of my jobs for RSI is to match the students with their interests and a mentor. So Dr. Mia is one that, that who's going to be a mentor now. And I've gotten to speak with a bunch of RSI alums who I knew way back when, and it was like no time has passed whatsoever. So I think really the best thing I did was really encounter so many extraordinary people and I hope that you, I would love to go back because I have <laughs> hindsight's 2020, but I really encourage you to stay connected with those you meet and really be open to listening about all the different fields. And it'll make career transitions for you easier than it did for me in the future because you won't be stuck in one, in one uh, path. And I think there, are there? I don't see any others. Okay. Right. But absolutely wonderful talk thank you so much dr wells all right and you're going um, to be a great rsi director <laughs> oh thank you so much and if anyone wants to get in touch with me has any personal questions or something about different avenues within biology or any fields or I'll if send I them your email you send them my way okay i welcome it. okay take care thanks so thank much for so being much. with us yes thank you bye-bye